to say it, I'll know it. <laughs> Revelation 16. Look what you do to my microphone. Okay, that wasn't you. It wasn't Taj. Revelation 16. You know it was Taj. <laughs> Anybody want to share a testimony? No. It does. It's hard hard living these days, right? Melissa. Um, yeah, I was praying for someone and recently they just had like a change of heart and really strong desire and they just wanted to Amen. I've been really blessed by our uh, Miami Beach ministry. You know, it's just um, something that God laid on our hearts years ago, just to have the gospel preached in South Florida. And every time there's a service there, you know, I kind of sit back in awe and just think, man, God's doing something. You know, it's neat to be able to see something happening that wouldn't happen otherwise. And like today, I was just looking at a visitor card of a doctor that visited our service today, and check, you know, he needs to be saved. And, uh, you know, I think he'll probably get saved. I got to talk to him after the service. He told me that he uh, has come to believe that there's a God and he's just not born again yet. I just think, well, you know what? Uh, and then the lady that brought him, she got saved a few weeks ago and she came because uh, Brother Scott had given her a flyer about six months or no, maybe like a, a, year. Two year, a year ago. Yeah. whatever it was more than a year ago and uh, so she got saved a couple of months ago and she's been bringing lots of families she's got unsaved kids an unsaved family that, that they're going to get saved I know they are and uh, you know what a thrill it is to see people that are hungry and, and uh, you know just think about we just have no idea what God is going to do with those people that he saves but you know it's just amazing well here we are Revelation Revelation uh, 16 we'll begin in in verse 12, and uh, we will we will uh, go to verse 16 or verse 15. And the sixth angel poured out his vial upon the great river Euphrates, and the water thereof was dried up, that the way of the kings of the east might be prepared. And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon, and out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet. For they are the spirits of devils working miracles which go forth unto the kings of the earth of the whole world to gather them to the battle of that great day of God Almighty. Behold, I come as a thief. Blessed is he that watcheth and keepeth his garments, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. Well, Father, I pray that you would enlighten us by your word this evening, that you would cement in our minds scriptural truth that will cause us to look forward to your coming. And Father, even as justice is what all of us ultimately need meted against us, it is also what we desire. And I pray that you would help us to see the great judgment that's coming. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we are here again in that place where God's hand is now involved with judgment. We're about to see Babylon fall and be judged and destroyed. And we're seeing these seven angels that have been given these vials from the angels surrounding the throne. And the judgments that are now being poured out are great and terrible. The first one, the first judgment was a noisome, grievous sore on everybody, every person that had the mark of the beast. That is, everyone except for those which had the seal of God on their foreheads. That is, the uh, the ones who were part of the 144,000 that are the, of the nation of Israel and those who would have followed uh, those individuals and taken the seal of God. Second, uh, it was that the blood, the sea had become blood. And the third was that the rivers and the fountains of the water had become blood. And this is different than the judgment before. This is where the water of the earth is now blood. 
and literally, if you're going to drink, you're going to drink blood. Is blood uh, drinkable? And the answer is Coke is, so you know, if you can get by on soda, you could get by on blood. But is it palatable? Uh, how long does it take for blood to go bad when it's out, to go rotten and so forth? Uh, not, not long. Can you imagine the world, the earth, being all the water, all the waterfront, all the water places being blood? And this is, when this judgment happens, uh, this would be a time when, in pride, man would look to God and say, God, that's terrible. What a terrible thing you've done. And so the angels in heaven have cried out, Thou art righteous, O Lord, which art and was and shall be because thou hast judged us, because they have shed the blood of saints. In other words, this judgment, as terrible as it is, is in kind. Is in kind to those who are, be, who are receiving it. And then the fourth angel poured out his vial in the sun, and, and the power was given that angel to scorch men, to scorch men with fire. The fifth angel poured out his vial, and uh, the kingdom was full of darkness. And then we last week saw our conclusion that these individuals who are being thus judged then blasphemed the God of heaven because of their pains and their sores and incidentally repented not of their deeds. And here are individuals who are in the wrong, who are the wicked ones, who are perfectly willing to do evil, and yet when the same measure is done against them, they blaspheme for it. In other words, their mindset is that I can do these things and it is not wrong. But if God judges me in kind for what I've done, then He is wrong. And do you know that is not a foreign mindset? That is not a foreign way of thinking. Many individuals believe that they ought to be able to sin against God in whatever manner that they should and yet, if God gives them consequence in kind, then He's an evil God. He ought to allow them to have their sinful pleasure without the consequence for the sin. And I want to remind us again this evening that sin is against God. Sometimes we look at our sin and we divorce it from the understanding that it is against God. And that it is a direct insult to God. My friend, whatever our sin is, whether it be you know, sins that are... You know, we have, I think, sometimes Christian sins. Sins that are, you know, at least acceptable among the believers. Um, complaining is, seems like it's a Christian sin. Whining is the same as complaining. Ingratitude. Uh, lack of love for the brethren. Gossip. Uh, all these things. These willingness to think evil of the brethren. All of these, quote, Christian sins, things that we excuse or relabel as something other than what God sees them to be, all of these things are against God. And yet when the same things are done to us, and sometimes even in a form of chastisement, we are very quick to be resentful about the same and feel as though it isn't right, it isn't fair, and God isn't just to allow these things. But I want to focus this evening uh, on one judgment, and that is the sixth angel's judgment, who pours out his vial on the river Euphrates, and the water is dried up so that the way of the kings of the east might be prepared. <laughs> yeah. This is the wicked of the earth challenging God, and God saying, come on, and then making a, uh, a smooth pathway for them to come to Him. You ever been in an old dried up riverbed or a place uh, where water once ran? Uh, a couple things about it is that uh, a dried up riverbed is level. If sand or dirt, earth, is, uh, been, has been, you know, the, the aggregate that's at the bottom of it, it's not stone where there would be a fall to it. So if you think about it, uh, you couldn't find a more level place. You know, the Daytona races started on the ocean, right on the beaches up in Daytona, you know, when the tide would be down. Uh, they would actually race out, and uh, land speed records used to be set there and so forth because of how flat and how level the ground is there. It, there's a sort of a silt or mud in the sand that makes it hard packed. 
and the water has a leveling effect. And literally, God says to those that want to come and defy Him and blaspheme, He says, come on, and He clears the way for them. I'll get, I'll get everything out of your way. You want to come and you want to fight against me, you come on. And literally, they're being drawn. And then we see these three, uh, three devils which are manifested out of the, out of the dragon and out of the beast. Uh, in, or the, out of the dragon and out of the beast and out of the mouth of the false prophet. And uh, we see the source of the miracles or the sorceries that these individuals are able to pull off. Do you remember the, the <clears throat> uh, sorcerers in Egypt? It's always been a bit of fascination to me. Not fascinating in the sense that I dwell on it, think on it, or study it. But it always is, has been fascinating or interesting that when Moses and Aaron, you know, turned their rod into a serpent, that they did the same thing. I don't know what means, you know, sorcery oftentimes involves trickery. And I think that anybody who has snakes is a sorcerer anyway. But the fact is, is that Moses and Aaron, or Moses' rod ate the other snakes. And so they lost their snakes. But here we find these individuals, you know, appear to be able to be to some degree invincible and indomitable, and we see the source is devils that are living in them, evil uh, representations of angels. And so now we see that they go out to bid to bid the kings of the earth to come and to make war against God Almighty. And we're going to spend our time at this point here, but before we do that. Let me just remind you of the motivation of the devil. The devil is not here trying to defeat God. The devil is trying to do what he does, which is destroy men. It's interesting. I mean, I do not believe for a moment that the devil is disillusioned about his end. Do you? Do you think that... I've heard preachers say before, the devil thinks he's going to win. But in the end, no, the devil knows he lost. Actually. The devil is defeated, and yet he still takes delight in seeing individuals destroyed. What is his motivation to bring the kings of earth on this pathway that has been, that has been leveled? Do you remember the Isaiah prophecy, every valley shall be... All the, every pathway made straight, every, or every mountain shall be brought low, every valley shall be exalted. And the, the pathway for the coming of the one who, uh, for the paving of a way of the Son of Man is made straight. And the idea of straight isn't just arrow straight, it also is level. The word straight it means in that context level as well. And so that's the picture I see here, except it's leveled for the wicked ones to come in a battle against God. In the midst of this, I find that the statement or the reference to God's judgment coming as a thief as rather uh, as causing one to think, if, if you think about it, right? What has been happening for more than three and a half years, now almost six years in this, in this time period? What has been happening? And who's been the cause of this? Could we, could we call it judgment? The destruction is judgment, right? Who's the cause or the source of the judgment? Yeah, man is the cause, God is the source. Okay, so, and you could say in a sense God caused the destruction. In other words, He didn't cause the evil, but He's the one who is destroying the wicked. Then, isn't it interesting when you come to verse 15, when God's Spirit all of a sudden becomes conversational, and says, Behold, I come as a thief. Behold, I come as a thief. And here we see God is not saying, I'm a thief. It's interesting to me. I shouldn't say interesting. I probably said the word interesting too many times this evening, so I'll try to forego it for a little bit. But I find that the way that people use the word as is oftentimes very inconsistent. Right? No one would call God a thief. We would understand that when the Bible says as a thief, in other words, uh, that God is not saying I come with malintent 
to take that which does not belong to me. Right? Are we in agreement? God's not a thief. So what is it about thieves? I had somebody last week uh, get in my blue car and open the glove box and find nothing. And uh, put, leave the glove box open and put papers on the floor. And uh, then I was mowing my neighbor's grass and I found my sun pass in their front yard. They stole the sun pass. And it was really ironic about that is my sun pass does not work. And I get... So even if they'd taken it, it was worthless. Uh, so, uh, but they took it. And the fact is, is that I've thought several times, you know, I'm really glad I wasn't there when they were in my car. You understand what I'm saying? Because I've thought, you know, that could be a real distraction. It might make headlines or something. Pastor assaults individual in his car or something. You know, they always make you out the bad guy or something like that. So that was better that they came in a sneaky way and got away and I didn't catch them and now God will deal with them and I don't have to think about it. So I'm good, they're not, and, uh, and by that I do not mean I'm righteous. I mean, you know, no harm, no foul on my part. You know, I didn't catch a thief. And, uh, and by the way, I, I've, I've caught thieves before and I haven't harmed them, so, you know. it's. Uh, but if I caught them in my car, who knows? You know, it just depends on what they did. So, the point being, when God says, I come as a thief, he's not saying I have malintent. He's saying this is the manner in which I come. And isn't it comical that when the same kind of phrases are used, that is, words for comparison, like or as, are used, that we go off and develop theology from it. In other words, a sound like a trump uh, or a reference to the trump of God. People think it's going to be you know, a brass instrument with three knobs on it that are played, you know, either, a, you know, probably not a bugle, but a trumpet of, of some sort, or some people think shafar. But it's just the voice. For instance, there's voice like a trumpet. And the idea of trumpet, if you'll ask Tony, is that it is deafeningly loud, and it is shocking, and it'll make you jump. And so that's the manner of the coming of God. So where, why does that fit in this passage of Scripture? Why do we have a shocking appearance, coming like a thief that is stealthy, sneaky, getting you by surprise, in the middle of a passage of Scripture that has one continual judgment after another? How is it surprising? See, that's a good question, isn't it? Well... Here we see a little excerpt grammatically, and the excerpt is God is speaking of the wicked, and all of a sudden we just get this little excursus or devotional, if you will, for the believers in the middle of it. Behold, I come as a thief. Who's being reminded that God comes as a thief? The wicked or the righteous? Well, let's look at a few passages of Scripture, and uh, some of them are are really shed light on these. One of them would be, uh, let's go to Matthew 24. That's a good one to begin in. Uh, and here's the illustration. Verse 36, Matthew 24. This is the passage where the, Jesus has been talking about the temple being destroyed and judgment coming and also His coming. And then His disciples came and asked three questions. When shall these, when shall these things be? What shall be the sign of Thy coming and of, in the, of the end of the world? And Jesus answered those questions in order, and He said, well, the, I'll tell you when they're not going to be, when you hear of wars, and you shall hear of wars and rumors of wars, see that you be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. So Jesus said, the wars and rumors of wars have zilch to do with My coming. And I, that is so hilarious to me because of the imagery that the prophecy fanatics use because they're always using wars and rumors of wars and headlines to prove that Jesus is coming and His coming is right around the corner. And Jesus said, when you hear of these things, see that ye be not troubled. That's actually a command. So don't get all upset over the quote, signs of the times because they ain't, to use good proper English. They're not signs of the times, the wars and rumors of wars. Okay, so let's look at a couple of other passages of Scripture that have to do with the day of the Lord. First, 
Thessalonians chapter 4 would be a good one for us to, to uh, peruse. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Um, verse 13, But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that ye sorrow not, even as those which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, we also, uh, even so them also which sleep in Jesus, will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep, that is, those that are in koimao or that, have, uh, that are in rest uh, or that have died. In verse 16, For the Lord Himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first, then we which are alive and remain shall be caught together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, so shall we be ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. Okay, so there's the catching up. The rapture is described here where the Lord catches us up in the in the air in the clouds. And it's so ridiculous that so-called Bible preachers today can't figure out the order of events and the distinction of events here. This is the snatching or catching up of the saints. And then there is the there are the events that catch people by surprise. Okay, and so we'll look at that. Uh, I was going to say something about this. Oh, well, this is described, we understand, uh, from 1 Corinthians chapter, or 2 Corinthians chapter 5, that those which are absent from the body and are present with the Lord are not in their bodies. So when we use the word in our context in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, that's speaking of the very thing that you could go to a grave and dig up. Right? You can actually go to a grave and you can exhume uh, men's bones who are with the Lord. But their bodies are there, and so that's what we're going to be caught up together with them. We're not going to prevent them, that is, to go before them. They're in heaven. They're going to come with Jesus, and then when we go up, their bodies are also going to go up with our physical bodies. We'll still be in our bodies. We won't ever be separated from our bodies when the Lord Jesus raptures us. And so we use the word rapture. It's a Latin word in and it's a fine enough word. It just means snatching, grabbing, or taking up, catching up, caught up in the air as we see here. And so the bodies that are in the graves will go up, and we'll go up, and they're already there, so we're not going to go before them. And they're going to hit their bodies, and we're going to be in our bodies, and we're all going to be with the Lord. And there's comfort to find in those words. A lot of fun, right? And I do hope that you're like me, and you think ahead and plan ahead. Are you organized people? You know, you need to be be practiced up for the rapture. And so, at least in your mind, imagine your Superman moves, you know, or the salute that you're going to give when you go up and maybe your last words. And I really hope, because the Bible says, uses the phrase that, Jesus, that God's going to come uh, in the twinkling of an eye or like the twinkling of an eye, that the suddenness of Christ's coming will be that we're going to be caught up like the Lord. Jesus, or what the angel said, uh, this same Jesus, which ye have seen ascend into heaven, shall so come in like manner as ye have seen him ascend into heaven. So we're going to ascend the same way that Jesus ascended. And so they watched him go up and was caught out. So we, we have witness of several ascensions in the Bible, and they're visible to the eye, and they're watchable events. And so I've been skydiving only once, and that was probably enough. It really honestly wasn't thrilling enough to try again. But... It, uh, I was skydiving, and I found that when you're suspended, weightless, in the air, you can just kind of flip and turn and do whatever you want. And so, as we're being caught up, I don't know if I'll do a couple backflips or goodbyes or, you know, y'all better straighten up or you're never going to go where I'm going or whatever it is. But think about your Superman moves and have a plan, or you'll just be like, whoa, what's happening? And you won't be ready. And that's the point of chapter 5. You need to be ready. The Bible says, but of the times and seasons, brethren... Uh, ye have no need that I write unto you, for yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. Oh, that's a familiar phrase, isn't it? Isn't that just exactly what we saw in Revelation 15? Thief in the night. 
Okay, so here we see that we're going to be caught up with the Lord, but now we see that the day of the Lord is a separate event. It's mentioned separately. Matter of fact, it's referred to as day of the Lord, and this, of course, is judgment. This is, the day of the Lord is Armageddon. It is this gathering of the kings of the world at the valley of Megiddo to fight against God, and God is literally, Jesus is going to speak their destruction with the sword of his mouth. That's the day of the Lord. The day of the Lord isn't when Jesus calls up the saints. The day of, we're going to come with Jesus. That's what the Bible says uh, when, when it describes the coming of Christ to meet these rebels who have come out to be destroyed by Him. Uh, we're going to be following Him and we're going to then participate in the millennial reign of Jesus Christ after the day of the Lord. And that's all chronological in Revelation. Okay, so let's just deal with 1 Thessalonians 5 then, and let's come to a point here or to an important perspective. Again, I ask the question to begin with, why is this, behold, I come as a thief? How does this fit? How does this belong in the middle of vile judgments? Seven angels are pouring out vials of judgment. All of a sudden we have, behold, I come as a thief. Who's that written to? Well, it's written to us to remind us about, about the coming for judgment, that it's going to be like a thief. And here we're going to see, in verse 3, here's when it's going to come. But when they shall say, Peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them, as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. But, verse 4, Ye brethren are not in darkness, that that day should overtake you as a thief. Ye are all children of light, and the children of the day. We are not of the night, nor of, nor of darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep, as do others, but let us watch and be sober. Uh, I know a couple of people that are martial artists. And, you know, I don't, I wouldn't give, I know some guys that are pretty good martial artists, and I know some guys that like martial arts. And there's probably a distinct difference. It, uh, I realized some years ago that a black belt doesn't make a fellow a good fighter. Uh, <laughs> and I could, well, I would, but I could illustrate that by uh, telling you of individuals I know who have black belts and even more than one belt or more than one degree of black belt, and I don't consider them to be that fantastic when it comes to their ability to fight. But they are fascinated with fighting. Martial arts is, you know, the fighting with hands or with instruments that are handheld. Uh, so it would be a, just a battle, uh, a soldier, I guess, or a, one who likes to battle. I met a couple of, uh, this is actually probably more than 10 years ago, I met a guy uh, who was a martial artist, and he was one of these guys that, you know, is a martial artist. You know, you know, if he were to describe himself, he is a martial artist. Say, what are you? Well, he had a job. I don't remember what that was, but he was a martial artist. And so, if you ate dinner with him in a restaurant, you know, he was so serious about his martial arts that he always had to have a table against the wall so nobody could sneak up behind him and so that he could see the room and everybody in it because he was ready. I asked him one time, who's trying to get you? And he said, I just want to be ready. You know, and I just thought, okay, all right, just be ready. But he made a good illustration for this. You see, the fact of the matter is, <laughs> anything I leave, um, I think there's a law, and I didn't know it, honestly. You people that grew up in Broward County, you know the bicycle rule, right? Any bicycle that is not chained up and really kept very, very secured is free for whoever wants to take it. You guys know that, right? And so that, that is a rule. There's a matter of fact, you lost one just the other day, right? You lost one in my front yard the other time too, but one disappeared off Charlie's uh, yard, uh, car a couple weeks ago. Matter of fact, I mean, it was only on there a couple hours too. That's the funny thing about it. And uh, they stole one right off of Charlie's car. Uh, but I, you know, I probably didn't steal. That's probably being unkind to the poor person because it was not locked, which means it was free to take, I believe. I think the same is true with vehicles that are parked uh, in front of your house on the street instead of in the driveway. And I think it's even true of vehicles that are parked in the driveway but not the upper half of the driveway. I think that's the rule. If you don't lock your car, then people can get in and, you know, they can have whatever it is that they like. But I've certainly found it to be true uh, living in Broward County that that's, there are individuals that seem to believe that. Now, like I said, I'm glad I've never caught anybody getting in my vehicle. Well, I have. I caught one guy. He's too crazy to do anything to. But uh, the, 
I have mostly only discovered people had been in my vehicle before. And, uh, you know, and again, you know, what are you going to steal from me? Uh, probably not anything that you could sell. It might have value to me, but it may not have value to anybody else. That's why they throw it in the neighbor's yard after they leave. My wife got her guitar stolen, and I found it down the street. They stashed it behind, so they didn't even take it. You know, it's like, what am I doing with this stupid? What am I going to do with this? You know, and they put it behind something. Didn't we have a vacuum stolen or something, too? And we found yeah. Anyway, they take stupid things. But uh, anyway, th that, that doesn't have a lot to do with anything. My point is this. If I were always paranoid about a thief the way some people are, like Chuck. Chuck would never have that happen to him, right? Uh, Chuck would never uh, leave anything out. He's always telling me, Pastor, somebody's going to steal that about my stuff. Or maybe it's Al. But, of course, Al got robbed, too, uh, <laughs> inside his garage. So I don't know if that works or not. But Al's always like, oh, I don't want to... You know, he, he has to watch everything. I'm not, I'll be honest with you, I don't think about thieves very much. I don't worry about them too much. And so I'm pretty, I'm a pretty good target, uh, I guess, uh, for thieves. And I'm glad because I don't want to spend my life worrying about stupid thieves. They're not worth the, they're not worth the thoughts to invest into. And that's my personal opinion on it. And if they're crazy enough to steal my broken up junk, then, I, you know, I need to open my garage and have them come clean it for me. <laughs> It'd be a real help, actually. So... Anyway, my point being this, uh, if I were watching constantly for a thief and a thief came and uh, tried to steal my sun pass, which doesn't work, I'd be ready, right? And I'd probably even have my moves, you know? I think I'd like to close them in the car, the red car, because the doors don't open. Unless you hit them. So if I caught one in the red car, I think I'd just shut the door. And let them be in there. Try to open the door. They'd think they were on one of those reality shows where the car locks and you can't get out. Only that's just what happens every time you get in my car. You know? <laughs> or something like that. I'd be ready for them. I'd think through my moves. You know? Maybe I'd pull their hair or something. I don't know if they had hair. Um, anyway, with the point being this, a guy that's ready for a thief the thief's not going to catch him by surprise. And any Christian who loves the Lord isn't looking for a thief. They're looking for Jesus to come. And as we see this day of judgment, we're reminded that Jesus is coming. Right in the middle of a passage of judgment, all of a sudden, Paul, uh, John just stops. And the Holy Spirit tells him to say, Behold, I come as a thief. In other words, when is this terrible judgment going to happen? Well, about probably somewhere between three and a half and seven years, nearer to seven, from the time that Jesus comes as a thief. And so what is the exhortation? Behold, I come as a thief, first the Revelation 15, 16. Blessed is he that watcheth and keepeth his garments, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. Keepeth his garments. Well, that means he stays dressed. He stays dressed. He's ready. What does that mean? Well, it means you're living like a Christian should. You're living for Jesus. You're doing what God wants you to do. And you're living as though the coming of Jesus is so real and so near that it's worth your time to live out your life and invest in it. And there's a blessing for people that are ready when Jesus comes. I really pray that when Jesus appears in the sky, my first thought will be, I thought so. I knew it. Wouldn't that be great? I thought he was coming. There you are. I knew it. You said it. You've always kept your word. I knew you'd be coming. And here in the middle of terrible judgment, the day of the Lord, God is about to destroy every last one of the wicked. And we're reminded there's a blessing for those that are ready for the coming of Jesus. And we're not of the darkness that that day would overtake us as a thief. Father, thank you for light. Thank you for truth. And I pray that you would help us to be ready when Jesus comes.